Good morning. How's everyone going? Uh, yes. Let's, let's do it again. That's, that's not enthusiastic enough. Good, good morning, morning. Gdansk. How are we feeling? Good? Woo! Excellent. Excellent. I think it was a big party last night. Um, I think a lot of people drank a lot of beer. And some vodka. And some Speciality. Vodka. I love it. So, um, I'm Raul. I'm Richard. Richard, we're from a company called Iterator Learning. We are the O because we're hipster and we deliver in-house Java training courses. And today what we're going to do is to give a talk with zero slides. No slides whatsoever. But plenty of code. But a pretty black and white shell. Don't we love it? <laughs> Woo! Thanks. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, Richard, it says J shell. What is this? J shell is a read eval print loop that comes with Java 9. So a lot of there's been a lot of discussion around Java 9 in the tech media on the blogosphere recently, mostly around modules, jigsaw, all that stuff. We're not really going to talk about any of that because there's probably a lot of other things which are kind of not really getting anywhere near as much attention, but are much more interesting. So J shell is a thing that lets you write Java statements and evaluate them. So you could just can add we do maths? couple of simple things together, like 1 plus 2 equals 3. Can you concatenate two strings as well? Can we concatenate two strings? A, B, C plus D, E, E, F. There no we way. go. Take Amazing. my money. Take my money. Take your money. Thankfully, it's free. We don't need, you don't need any of your money. Fantastic. Okay. But you know something that's really, really annoyed me with Java? Yeah, I, I know the feeling. Java is so verbose. So really many lines reverse. of code to write. Um, to be honest, if you're paid by lines of code, it's great. We yeah. love it. That's definitely the way to build people. Um, so, for example, suppose I've got a list of, of strings, and I want to just come along here and uh, add in some values to it. So, like, add hello, values.add. World values dot add from values dot add Gdansk Java oh yeah 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 Gdansk there we go beautiful amazing uh, so what's I've values like values is a string with hello world from Gdansk but it took me quite a while there just to get a list with a few values in it doesn't it this is the kind of thing that really annoys me about Java Richard I know. Java 5 added arrays as list. You can have just a one liner for this. There's no need to call this add method. So you're saying I can just say arrays.add list. Hello world. Like exactly. That. There you go. Problem solved. Well, somewhat, but it's only really giving me a list that's backing an array, isn't it? Have you ever used this API? Why don't you just add you know, an, another word to it? What, like, say I add from PHP? Oh, yes, PHP, beautiful. Uh, well, we all knew PHP doesn't really work anyway. But maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing. But it, so values.add is an unsupported operation. You can't add things. You can't change the length of this list. Um, it feels like it's immutable, right? Yeah, what about? Um, isn't it backed by uh, an array like set? Can we say dot set? We can. So we can also say set zero. Uh, goodbye. Why does that work? And so that changes the value. So arrays.list isn't immutable. It's not fully mutable. It's just a bit of a weird uh, collection concept. And we can't create sets with it. We can't create maps with it. It's not really a complete solution. Mm. But you know what is a much better solution to this? Java 9? Java 9, yeah. So Java 9 adds a bunch of factory methods that sit on the interfaces that build immutable versions of them. So say I say uh, values uh, list.of hello world. Um, and if I want to add a string to it, like this, it's immutable, so we can't change it. Uh, it's not just for strings that are PHP. We could also do that as well. It wouldn't work either. So it's genuinely immutable. What about dot .set? And we can't just set the first string to be uh, goodbye either. That's genuinely immutable. We can't do something like values.remove0 either. 
that won't work. So it's values are values. So Richard, that's great that we've got a factory method. Can we do the same with sets? Absolutely. Uh, we can instantiate a set. Again, set.of and a couple of strings like that. Lovely. So um, you know, this is great, but you know, you know, in Python, you know, I use a bit of Python as well. They've got some syntactic around all this stuff. Why does Java doesn't provide this as well? You know, square brackets, you get a That's list. That's a good question. So you're saying, wh why don't they do something like? Like the two-string representation here. Like that? Yes. Well, that definitely won't work in Java. Illegal I. style of expression. I think part of the reason here is there was some discussion in the core libraries team at Oracle about this kind of thing. And they looked at uh, the cost-benefit trade-offs you have from things like set.of versus the specific syntax and decided the costs for adding the specific syntax just weren't worth it compared with the value add you get over the factory method, which isn't a huge amount. Fair enough. So, um, you know, another of my favorite data structure, Richard, is a map. Yep. You know, what have we got available to work with map? Because it's also quite verbose to set up. You've got your, your key, your value, you have to instantiate a map, you have to do so let's, let's put a map together with some city population. So where were you born? I was born in Belgium, in Brussels. And how many people live in Brussels? 1,143, uh, sorry, 1,143,000 people. Right, so I Brussels. did go on Wikipedia before the talk. That's research. Uh, I was born in Cardiff. You missed Wales. a zero, Richard. You missed, missed a zero. A zero. Oh, I nearly got away with it. There you go. Uh, and Cardiff has about 341,000 people living there. Uh -huh. So you get a map there, and the, what there is is there's a map.of, which is a series of different overloads of key value pairs. So there's one with a single key value pair, two key value pairs, all the way up to 10. All right. Uh, that still feels like it uh, could be quite error prone because you're mixing you know, a same argument list here with different types. You know, I'm used to work with uh, entries using map. Is mm. there something else available that better models the edit? I've got an entry between the, the city and its population. Yeah, so there's actually a factory method for building entries added. So I can say something like map.entry, Brussels, uh, 1.139 million, like that. Or, as I expect people more commonly use it, you just statically import the entry, and it'll work like that. There's also a uh, map constructor that's called of entries. You can see the REPL does a bit of tab completion whilst we're here, and we can build it up like this. Now, the advantage of this is it supports an arbitrary length series of entries for the map, so you can, there's no restriction. If you want more than 10, you can turn the volume up to 11. Beautiful. Great, so factory methods added in Java 9 makes things a little bit more concise and easier to work with. Yeah, yeah. So, Richard, the next thing, you know, in Java 8, one of the things that I really love is the Stream API. Yeah. Is there anything new to the Stream API? There's a few new things to the Stream API. Um, perhaps a good way of starting is just thinking about a really, really exciting programming problem, configuration setup. Yeah, so let's say we've got a list of uh, potential properties that we'd like to look up. Setting names. So. Uh, by default, Java has a property called user.home, which gives the user's home directory. Maybe we want to give people the option to override that with something else called, say, user home, but then flip back to that as a backup if it's not there. So if we want to write that using streams code in Java 8, it gets a little bit fiddly. So we need to stream those values. Then what we could do is we could say flat map them. So flat map is an operation on the streams API that takes a value and maps it into a stream of values. So we could say something like, take the uh, name of the property and get the value. So look up that property from the name. But that could return null, right? So let's add a check for this. Absolutely, it could return null. So maybe it's null. You want the value here in your condition? Oh, I do. Oh, I do. Um, we'll uh, have to fix that in a little bit. Uh, actually, let's just get out of that. There we go. So if I start off with the flat map, look up the value. Check if the value is null. Check if the value is null. Uh, and then I want to return stream.empty. 
and otherwise wrap it up into a stream. Wrap it up. So I want stream of value. Lovely. And then that returns from that brace there. One more. And then one more. And I can just call the find first operation at the end. And that will tell me that's where your home directory was, because we didn't override it. Right. Um, Do you love that code? Well, again, if you're paid by lines of code, absolutely beautiful. But uh, if you want to write some good Java code, um, it feels quite clunky and verbose, Richard. Surely there is a different way of doing this. Come yeah. On. So if we start back off with our uh, setting names, streaming them, what was added in Java 9 was a nice stream of nullable factory method. So we could take that name and say stream of nullable system.get property on the name and then do a find first at the end. Right. Okay. So we're talking about taking all of this and switching to this and less error prone code as well. You just call one method and it's done. Indeed. So that's an example of a clunky pattern that's made it to the Java 9 API. So um, let's switch things up a little bit, uh, Richard. Yeah, I hear you know a little bit about Java 9 as well. Um, I know a couple of tricks couple of added tricks. to Java 9. So cool. um, the first thing that we're going to try and do is to process a list of payment, Richard. Expense payments? I, I hate expense payments. So what should we do? Let's, um, you know, let, let's focus on the, the expensive stuff, you know, the, the real. The big payments. The big, beautiful, huge payments. Um, so we're just going to filter them out, all right? OK. So, so what's a big payment to you? Over 500 pounds? Let's say over 500 pounds. Perfect. And we'll collect to a list. So what you're doing is you're going to get the things that were in payments by value, but that are greater than or equal to 500 pounds. Indeed. So filter available in Java 8 solves the problem, Richard. So if I have a look at this code here, Raoul, I notice that your payments are already, they're already sorted. You've got a very eager accountant. They are already sorted, so maybe if I had a list of a, a billion payments, you know, it'd be a lot of processing just to filter those ones that are greater than 500, right? Mm. So in Java 9, there's a nice little um, method that has a short circuiting property called take while that was added, and returns the same answer, but more importantly, as soon as it's find a payment that where the predicate is invalidated, it short circuit the streams. So it avoids us to reduce the number of computation required. So that's quite handy to have at hand. Awesome. Now, there is the, um, the sister of take while called drop, drop while. while. That was also added. And there's the other way around. OK? So it drops whilst that predicate holds true. And, and then once it goes false, it keeps everything after that point, right? Precisely, precisely. So useful method to have around. But keep in mind that if you're using parallel streams, uh, take while and drop while have additional overhead because they need to keep track of different uh, partitions. They have to keep track of the order and coordinate their work. So yeah. they could be more expensive uh, if you use parallel streams. But you know something else I really like about the streams API? It's, it's the iterate method. Gives you, lets you easily make kind of like a series of numbers type thing. Right. So something like list comprehension that other programming languages have. Yeah, like a list comprehension. So what about this, Richard? Oh my god, hold on. What, what happened? Those were lots of numbers. Lots of numbers. And the reason for that is because iterate gives us an infinite stream. Kind of iterates a number here and, you know, forever. And so how did you stop that? I pressed Control-C to exit. Oh, from to, the kill the, to kill the task. Excellent. So another way to, to fix this problem is if you want a, a certain number of elements, you can say limit, truncates the size of the stream. That's cool. So that takes an infinite stream and makes it finite. Indeed. But when you've done limit there, you've limited the stream based upon the number of elements. So suppose instead of just adding one, I was adding two, and I wanted to stop it uh, before the number got over 10. How, how, would, I do, how would I do that? Well, let's, uh, let's use a friend filter that we used earlier, right? Of course. So say smaller than 10. Let's maybe start at number three, so we see a couple of things going on here. OK. Let's just print this. Oh, so hold on. Three, five, nine. 
It was blocked. It, the program was still running here at night. Right. So, and you had to control C it again to get it to quit. So we've got this weird Nasty. behavior here because unfortunately you still get an infinite stream. You filter out those numbers, but there's no way for the stream to short circuit the operation. It's still calculating numbers and filtering them out. So that's a bit of a bummer. Seems like a bit of an oversight. Is there anything in Java 9 that'll fix that? Oh, we've just learned about take while, Richard. Of course. So we could actually do this. Lovely. But, you know, other programming languages, again, have got some nice little syntactic goodies around this kind of stuff. Built into the iterate. So iterate in Java 9 is overloaded now to take another argument, which is a predicate, which essentially is going to do just that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool. But Richard, you know what else I really love about Java 8? What is? What do you love? Collectors. They're powerful, aren't they? The collector APIs. So let's say we've got a bunch of purchases. What I can do using collectors is to say things like collect, grouping by, uh, the expense year, you know, so kind of SQL-like operations here. And you can see I've got a map here that's built up where the key is the year and cool. the values are all the expenses. And you can do things a bit more complicated. For example, I may wish to say um, I want to find the total amount for each year. Okay? So that's what you can do using collectors. Pretty, pretty sexy. Nice, nice. So what are we going to do now, Richard? What's the next problem to solve? Uh, well, how about we try and collect together the values, the total expenses by the different category? Like, how much money have you spent on travel? How much money have you spent on food? How much money have you spent on entertainment? Have you actually spent more money on booze than food? That's the question we want to ask ourselves. Yeah, I, I tend to spend a lot of money on booze. Um, let's come back to that query, Richard, uh, in okay. just a sec. Let's, um, let's uh, figure out the stuff that is expensive here, you know, like, like we had earlier. But oh, right, the, uh, so you want to find really expensive items. Okay, so we well, can just, just filter the expenses, can't you? Yeah, let's just use the get amount. We're at 1,000 pounds, okay? okay? Let's go crazy and collect that. Grouping by the expense year. All right. So how, how much have you... How does that look? What were the big expenses in the given year? Utility. Yeah, I didn't tell you, Richard, but I actually have a jacuzzi at home. Wow, uh, that's nice. <laughs> one day. Um, so something happened here, Richard, something a bit peculiar. Yeah, I mean, you what, tried to group those things by the year, didn't you? Hmm. And you have expenses in years other than 2016. You've got ones in, like, one in 2015 here. But it's just kind of disappeared. Is this, is this your new route to paying less taxes? You just strip out those years and pretend you weren't around then? I think this is the takeaway from this talk. If you want to reduce your tax bill, use the collect API. Um, but really what happened here is that, unfortunately, we filtered those elements before they come into the collect API. Okay. Uh, and 2015 was gone. So the collector never saw 2015. Indeed. So in Java right. 9, there's a new useful collector called filtering, which essentially moves that predicate back at the collector level. And then we can group that back into a list. So awesome. Here you go, you got 2015. So you've got 2015, and you know that there were no expensive items in 2015. Indeed. So collector's API, unfortunately, doesn't help you reduce your tax bill, but helps you write good code that reads like the problem statement. So that's, that's a bonus. So you mentioned categories earlier. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's extract the categories just to get a feel for what okay. I'm spending money on. So let's get, a, let's get a stream. Yep. We'll do a map. OK, so you're going to map each expense to its category? Yeah, we'll get the, get the tags. Tags. Collect that to, is there a set? There is. So yeah. we get only unique ones, all right? OK. Mm. But what it looks like, though, is because those get tags, that's a list, isn't it? So you've got utility, food entertainment, travel entertainment. Now, this query is showing a bit of accuracy here. You've got a lot of entertainment expenses. But maybe we just wanted the plain list, set the plain set of categories. How can we do that? Guilty, Richard, guilty. Um, well, Java 
is making flat map cool again. Awesome. So flat when map. When was flat map not cool? That's what I want to know. <laughs> That's true. And what we need to do is kind of change a little bit the operation as passed as an argument so it returns a stream. And what flat map will do is to flatten all those intermediate streams that are produced. And if we do this, we get a, a unique list of uh, tags, Richard. Awesome, awesome. So we've got the tags. Do you want to know how much money we spent on each of those things? Um, I'm quite curious, actually, what I'm doing every year. What you're know? doing every year. OK. Yeah. What tags are associated to a given year? So kind of combining this map here with a grouping by. You know, let's okay. see if we can do this. So can't we just flat map the thing and then do a grouping by? Um, if you flat map of and you course, do... Of course, you lose the information, don't you? You don't have the year that you can group by on. Yes, yeah, so we still need those expenses. So we've got a full information. So what we want to do is something like that. So it's given the expense, let's get the year. Okay. But now we want to extract the tags. Awesome. So it's called this collector called mapping, available in Java 8. What that's going to do here is to extract each tags put it into a set, and build a pretty map for us, like okay. that. OK. But that's still got the same problem here, hasn't it, that you've got a set with two lists in, rather than a flat set of tags. Can someone guess what's the new collector added to Java 9? How about flat mapping? That sounds pretty reasonable, Richard. Let's, let's try, see what happens. Flat mapping, what a beautiful name, flat mapping. <laughs> and doesn't work, Richard, why not? Because uh, you're returning a list, not a stream. Exactly. That's a, that's a very, very not succinct error message there, but that's what it's telling you. Oh, it's pretty scary, actually. Um, so we need to get our expense here. We need to get the expense, get the tags, and then stream that and get rid of this method reference here. Unfortunately, we can't use a method reference because we've got two nested calls. OK. And there we Still go. Good. Problem awesome. solved. Awesome. Awesome. So flat map again in Java. It's cool again. It's important. Um, so that's the updates for the collectors API. So a couple of quite useful little methods available to express more complicated uh, problem statement, Richard. But um, you know, one of the things that I really love about Java 8 is that it added this optional data type, you know, really inspired from functional programming. Yeah, yeah. Reduces scope for bugs. So what have so, we got? So, so the optional type is there to wrap up the idea of values that may be present or absent. So it's like a, a box that either contains one element or nothing. Um, so we can perhaps iterate on our earlier settings example and perhaps look up settings. So if I've got a, a setting dot look up setting by name, and I say user.home, it'll return me, uh, this is the home directory, but wrapped up in an optional, saying it was genuinely present. So that sounds like a, a useful thing to do. The API here models the idea that we may or may not have a, a, a value from it, so it's optional, yeah. and let the caller deal with that. And if I've got this case where there's nothing there, it just returns empty, like das das, who's got a setting called das das. Right, so why don't we refactor our example with the setting names to call this method then? So we're going to stream those settings. Yep. Uh, and then we need to map each setting name into its optional of setting. So I'm going to say, take that map. And in fact, I can just use a method reference here, can't I? So I can just with say. With two colons? Look up with two colons, indeed. Look up setting by name. Uh huh. Then I've got a stream with a bunch of optionals in. Hold now, on. There is a, there's a method called is present, right? Yeah, yeah. So what I can do, or the Java 8 way of solving this problem, is I do a filtering operation and say optional colon colon is present. Now I've got a stream of optionals, but they are optionals that only have values in. So I need to unbox them. Dot get, optional dot get. Exact Mundo. And now I've just got a stream, so I'm just going to say fine first. 
And so I get an optional saying, this is your home directory. Hmm. Richard. And if you look at Java 8 code, you begin to see this pattern, this filter is present map get kind of pattern appearing quite a lot. You know, seems quite clunky, quite verbose. You know, last yeah. time I looked, is present and get are not actually recommended to use because it's not really an improvement. It's, it's a bit of an anti pattern, isn't it? It is, yeah. So have you got something better in the Google There is Box? something better in Java 9. So uh, if we go back to the top, we stream our settings. If we map our settings into some optionals, what they've added is a method on optional that converts it into a stream. And then you can flat map over this stream. So you can say. Flat map. We always love a cheeky flat map. Flat map, optional, colon, colon, stream. And then you find first at the end. So a little bit nicer. What we've basically done is replaced these guys with this. All right, so more idiomatic usage of the optional API. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're familiar with the stream API already, you know, migration kind of overhead between those two conceptually is fairly simple because an optional, it's a bit like a stream that is empty or with one value. So it makes a lot of sense to have this method. Awesome, awesome. So I fly around a lot, you fly around a lot, running training courses all over Europe. I know what, what we're we do we do quite a lot of? Let's, let's write a new software. Yep with a beautiful UI. Amazing. And it's going to help us check in for our flights. Right, yeah. So what we've got here is a, a booking class. And we can look up a booking. So say from London City Airport to Gdansk. Apparently, that's a flight that exists in our system. But I don't know, say Cardiff Wales Airport to Gdansk. Nothing doing, because Cardiff Wales is a terrible airport to fly from. Um, and then our fancy, fancy UI, we've got a couple of options here. A, a method called display the check-in page. And uh, I'm not going to run that for now. And then we've got another method here called display the missing booking page that's just going to tell us we've got a missing booking. So how are we going to wire up this thing that looks up some storage from our back-end system, gives us an optional of booking? and displays the different pages based upon what's appropriate. Well, so Richard, you know, I can see this error here on the display checking. It's saying it's missing yeah. an argument. So why don't we take our optional uh, object there? There's yep. a, a method called uh, if present. And that's going to unwrap your optional and give you the booking that you need. Yeah. So if there's something in the box, it'll take a function and call the value in the box on that function. So that's our UI colon colon display check-in page. Awesome, right. So we're now going on to the check-in system for booking between City Airport and Gdansk. What a beautiful UI. But the problem is here, uh, what if I've got something where uh, there's no value in there? It's from something from, say, Cardiff to Gdansk. There's Richard, no UI at all. It does nothing. We, we can't do that to our customers and users. You need to give an error message somehow. Yeah. So again, thankfully, there's a nice little Java 9 method that comes in here called if present or else. And that takes two functions. So the first one is the what do you do when there is a value present. And the second one is the what do you do when the thing is missing. So that says missing booking now. And if I was doing something from, say, London City, where we had a booking, it would be there. Awesome. Fantastic. So another little hole that got, that got kind of filled in in Java 9. That, that sounds good. Um, so we've talked about the case where there isn't or is a, a value in the optional. But what if maybe I get two optionals? How do I compose those two things together, Richard? Two optionals. How do I compose them together? Yeah, so I've got a good example of this. Suppose you're in a situation where you've got some companies who are clients, and you've got an address book of those clients. Or perhaps you've got some companies who aren't clients, but uh, you just want to look up their address from like a public telephone directory or something like that, or you just Google these days, wouldn't you? Um, but they may not be on either of those things. Maybe their address is, is hidden, invisible. Or maybe you've just typoed their name. So let's have a think about that. So show, show me some code, Richard. Show me some code. Let's take a name of a client. 
That's a great client name. A client, yep, absolutely. Well, you know it's a client. And then we can look up the client. So if we look up the client by name, we'll see that they're based in London. Awesome. What, what happens if uh, we don't find a client? Uh, well, a B client, what happens? Blah, 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 blah. We'll get an optional or empty. So again, we're using the optional to model the we might have something, we might not as a return value. But we've also got a backup method here called lookup company details. So again, if we do some nonsense, this will fail. But if we look up, say, a company, oh. another company, it'll say that their address is in Cambridge. Fantastic. OK. The question is, how do we put these things together? I think that's what you were asking me at the beginning. Mm. So a kind of common approach that you would see. What I'd like to do is provide a fallback. You know, if find client returns an empty optional, I want to be able to call this other method there. Well, there's this kind of or else get method that says, if this thing's empty, we can try and call this other function. So let's try that. Let's say, or else get uh, lookup company details with that same name. Ah, now the problem it's saying here, a much more readable error message actually, is optional of client cannot be converted to client. The problem is that or else get takes a function that must succeed, right? It's got to return a normal value that then gets returned. And what we've got here is we've got something that we want to chain where it might fail, and the backup might also fail. You might not be able to look this company up in the phone directory or something. So. That is, again, a nice situation that gets dealt with in Java 9 with a method simply called or. Take this optional or call this function that returns another optional. So if the name is a client, it calls find client and returns that. If you change that to another company? If we change that to another company, we get the address from the phone book. So looking at that's in Cambridge. And if what happens is that name is uh, Richard being really tired and just plopping his face on the keyboard before he goes to sleep. Or more realistically, having a big night out like you always do. Then, then we get an optional dot empty. Fantastic. So looks like the optional API now is really composable and quite rich to express some uh, um, more complex use cases too. Fantastic. Awesome. So we gave this talk in the REPL, in the live shell, and kind of just live coded it. But if you're interested, actually, in looking at some of the example code from uh, these kind of things, we've also written a bunch of articles. So if you just go to iteratorlearning.com slash articles, you can see that there's a bunch of ones up there on Java 9 with uh, example bits of code that might be useful to you, um, or also talking about other things like pipes and filters in, in Acker and stuff like that. Iterator with a DO. Without the O. <laughs> Hips the way. Yes. And we also deliver various uh, in house training courses in Java, ranging from functional programming to reactive programming and design patterns. So do check it out. And I think we've got time for questions um, from, from you guys. So I don't know if someone's. So does anyone have or... any questions? If anyone has a question, please raise your hand. We'll go on with microphone. No one. Yes. Oh, there is one. Okay. Carol is running. Excellent. Uh, hello. Uh, you showed a lot of uh, new great APIs. I wanted to ask what is the main gap or what has Oracle missed in Java 9 regarding collections or maybe some other APIs that you think sh should be um, uh, implemented but they missed? Um, so first of all, there's an, another quite, uh, there's quite a few updates to the completable future uh, class from Java 8, which we haven't covered ahead today, but there's quite a few addition added to that. So if you are doing asynchronous computations, there's a couple of methods to do asynchronous timeouts. That's something that was added. Uh, things that Oracle uh, has missed uh, for this uh, release. I think it was mostly kind of a tidy things up with the kind of major APIs that were introduced in Java 8. That's the purpose of uh, the core updates to Java 9. 
it's always a bit difficult to say uh, whether something's missing as such, because there's always lots and lots of things that would be great to have added to Java. But I'm not sure I want to say that they're definitely missing as much as they'd be a great addition. So something we've been looking at recently a lot of is uh, functional data structures. Uh, so data structures which are much more efficient if you're expecting them to be immutable. And that's something that Java doesn't really deal with very well in the core libraries. But there's a bunch of third-party libraries, such as Vava, for example, has been adding a few of them. They recently got renamed. Um, and there's a few other libraries on, on GitHub and on Maven Central and things like that. So there are things that you can get there which might be nice to be in the core libraries at some point in time in the future but aren't there yet. Indeed, yeah. So immutable collections, it's a big one, but like Richard is saying, you know, there's tons of libraries that, that can add that. And as I was saying last night over dinner, there's a bunch of other kind of older core libraries that perhaps could do with a, a bit of a, a refresh, like NIO, for example, the, the IO pattern. Is a, could, do, could do with some love. Could do with some love. Could do with some love. And it's worth mentioning, um, you know, Java 10, which is there's quite a few prototypes for the Valhalla project, is looking at adding value types, primitive specialized generics that should help bring the close the gap between abstraction and performance. So that's, that's in the pipeline. So there's quite a few exciting things coming up, which will generally help the whole JVM ecosystem, not just Java, the language. Absolutely. Are there any other questions? Oh. Oh, there is one. OK. In the middle. Do you want to please, please raise your hand again, just so the lady can we'll, find you? We, we all know, yeah. Does uh, JSHA provide some syntax, syntax highlighting, or it's only single color always? I, th I think at the moment, I've not seen any syntax highlighting at the moment. But it does have some quite cool features, though. Uh, for example, it's got forward declaration. So you can write a function that depends on another function that you haven't written yet. And then you can write that function later on. Uh, which is a feature that they kind of had to hack Java C to get working a little bit, but it's quite an interesting feature, and the kind of thing that some of the other REPLs don't do or don't do yet. But maybe uh, someone will hack some plugin or something or for some it. syntax highlighting. Um, yeah. There's a few other commands which we haven't shown that kind of lets you list classes and the signature of different methods, which can be quite useful for interactive learning for a new API. But syntax coloring would be quite nice to have, I agree. But black and white is cool as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Is there another person over there, I think? Or? Okay. Hi. Uh, so I really like the example of converting or mapping optionals into the streams, but I'm a little bit worried about the performance. So how does it behave? Because I'm basically creating a bunch of streams for every optional. So how does it behave with regular streams and parallel streams? Um, so I guess the thing is, uh, w with any kind of general performance statement is you should be measuring what the improvement is rather than uh, kind of reasoning about it axiomatically tends to not work very well for performance problems. But having said that, um, if you look at stream.ofNullable, um, if there's not actually a value there, it's going to return an empty stream. Um, and those empty stream values tend to get cached anyway, so that tends to be pretty cheap. And if it's actually wrapping a value up, it's just doing the same thing as stream.of. And there's a specialized stream.of overload for single arguments. So again, that's an API that's been a little bit optimized. So it's, I'm not saying it's necessarily the most awesomely performant API. I've not really benchmarked it myself. But you can definitely see that there's a couple of places where at least the kind of obvious sensible optimizations have been put in place. And I might add, um, there's discussion for optional to become a value type as well uh, for, for Java 10, which would reduce the memory allocation pressure for creating those different objects there. So it's not too much of a concern, but again, yeah, benchmarking is probably the, the right uh, answer. OK, guys, thank you very much. Give a round of applause for Richard and Raul. Thank you very much. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Yep.